Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So, um, for the last two classes, I've been introducing some of the basic notions of um, uh, relativistic dynamics, and in particular, the conservation of energy and momentum. And today, I would like to continue this discussion, describe a few more features of our relativistic expressions for angular mom for momentum and energy. Um, and then next class, we'll uh, complete our discussion of relativistic dynamics and indeed our discussion of special relativity and move on uh, to bigger uh, and better things. So let me just remind you of where we've been for the last few classes. So we've learned that the relativistic expression for energy and momentum differs slightly from that in Newtonian physics. In particular, in uh, relativity, it's typical to include a rest energy for a particle in the expression for the energy, so that the total energy is gamma mc squared, where gamma is the one of the square root of 1 minus d squared over c squared. And likewise, the momentum of an object is gamma times its mass times its velocity, rather than just mass times velocity, as it would be in Newtonian physics. And we discovered last time something truly remarkable, which is that these expressions are frame dependent. That is to say, the value of energy and momentum of an object, as measured by an observer, depends on the frame of the observer in exactly the same way as uh, yeah. as um, as uh, the time separations and spatial separations between events in uh, special relativity. So, uh, in particular, if you have uh, an energy and a momentum as measured in one frame s, and you wish to relate them to the energy e prime and momentum p prime as measured in a different frame s prime, then they are related by the same sort of formulas that one uses to relate time separations and spatial separations uh, in via a Lorentz transformation. Or, if instead of using these two linear equations, I wanted to use a slightly more succinct uh, notation involving vectors and matrix multiplications, I would say that if I collect the energy and momentum into a column vector, E and CP, where C is the speed of light, then the rule which allows me to transform between these expressions in one frame and these expressions in another frame is just the same rule that we discovered in our discussion of the geometry of space-time. Namely, it's the Lorentz transformation rule involving the hyperbolic sine and cosine of the rapidity phi. Um, so I'd like to spend the next few minutes making a few more uh, comments on this uh, observation. But before I do so, let me pause and see if there are any questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, that was a bit of, OK. OK, well, this is not something that I was planning on discussing, but it's a very important point. So maybe I'll spend a, a moment to discuss it. Okay. Um, so maybe uh, in order to understand the in reason why the Lorentz transformation takes exactly for energy and momentum takes the same form as for space and time, we really should think about this in the context of what is known as Noether's theorem. So throughout your lives as physicists, 
you've learned of several different sorts of quantities that obey a conservation law. So if you have a, a collection of objects that are undergoing some very complicated dynamical process, then one of the rules that you've used to analyze the system is the conservation of energy. The energy beforehand has to be the energy afterwards. Or likewise, the conservation of momentum. The momentum of the system beforehand has to be the momentum of the system afterwards. Or the conservation of angular momentum. The angular momentum beforehand has to be the angular momentum afterwards. And there are even other uh, more complicated uh, or more subtle sorts of uh, conservation laws, such as if you take an electron and a proton and you collide them together, one of them has charge plus one, the other has charge minus one for a total charge zero. So that means whatever you get out at the end of the day has to also have charge zero. That would be a, an example of the conservation of charge. So um, it turns out that there's a very deep relationship uh, between uh, these conservation laws and um, the notion of symmetries in physics. So what is a symmetry in physics? A symmetry is a way of changing your description of the variables that you use to describe a physical system, which leaves the equations of motion unchanged. So, for example, if I were to write down a set of physical laws that govern the dynamics of this piece of chalk as I were to throw it up in the air, then I would write down an equation, a differential equation, uh, obeyed by the position of this chalk as a function of time. And if I were to relabel the time coordinate by choosing instead of t equals zero being right now, I could take t equals zero to be during the time of Julius Caesar, um, that change in my choice of time variable wouldn't change the laws of motion that are obeyed by this piece of chalk. And so because of that, we say that the laws of physics are time translation invariant. Okay. We've encountered this notion earlier when we talked about, um, when we talked about uh, the symmetries of Galilean boosts and Newtonian physics. Likewise, if I choose to label the position of this chalk uh, along the horizontal line with x equals zero being that wall over there, or x equals zero being that wall over there, that won't change the actual equation obeyed by uh, this chalk as it moves through the air. So because of that, we would say that the laws of physics are invariant under spatial translations. And one of the Perhaps the most important laws of physics is referred to as Noether's theorem, which is the statement that for each symmetry of the laws of nature, that symmetry leads to a conserved quantity and vice versa. important enough theorem that I named my daughter after Noether. Her name was Emmy. Okay, so that tells you how important a theorem it is. Don't tell my wife, though. She thinks she's named after Emmy with someone else. Okay. Um, so, um, for example, the fact that the laws of motion that govern this piece of chalk are independent of the choice of label of time, I could shift time, is what leads to conservation of energy. And the fact that I have a spatial translation symmetry in my laws of physics is what leads to conservation of momentum. The fact that I could take the coordinate system describing physics in this classroom and rotate it, and that would leave the equations unchanged, is what leads to the conservation of angular momentum. And in special relativity, we have learned that energy and momentum now take a new form their relativistic energy and momentum. And the statement, the reason why energy and momentum are conserved in special relativity is that the laws of physics are invariant under Lorentz boosts, the symmetries of space-time in special relativity. And so Noether's theorem tells us about a fundamental relationship between the conserved quantities of energy and momentum in special relativity and the symmetries of space-time. And so I think that a proof of Noether's theorem is something that, um, well, 
It's not exactly beyond what you could see at this point, but it might take us a little bit aside from where I want to go in this course. So, uh, for example, have you guys seen Lagrangian mechanics yet? Okay. There's a very simple proof of it based on Lagrangian mechanics. So for those of you who are taking physics 251 or whatever it is, you'll learn Lagrangian mechanics by the end of the semester. So maybe you'll see it in that class. Um, but the basic idea is that for every symmetry of, for every conserved quantity, there is a symmetry and vice versa. Okay. So um, just, uh, okay, this is a bit of an aside, but just for example, I mentioned the conservation of electric charge. Um, there is a symmetry associated with the conservation of electric charge. It's a little bit different from like a translation symmetry in space. It's what's called a gauge symmetry, okay, which is a fundamental symmetry of electromagnetism. And if you ever hear about string theorists or particle theorists talking about extra dimensions, then the reason why they like these extra dimensions is that they want to change these uh, other fictitious symmetries, these gauge symmetries, into fundamental geometric symmetries. Okay. So what is the extra dimension that a string theorist would like to talk about? Uh, well, it's an extra dimension such that a translation in one of those extra dimensions leads to a conserved quantity, and the conserved quantity that we call that is electric charge, for example. And so by understanding the uh, fundamental conserved quantities in particle physics, one can understand the corresponding geometry of the extra dimensions of space that a string theorist would talk about. I don't know why I'm saying this. We're supposed to be talking <laughs> about um, special relativity. Um, are there any other questions? But, I mean, it, Noether's theorem is, I think, the most fundamental principle uh, in physics. If I had to name one, this would probably be it. Um, yes. Yeah, okay. I mean, um, we could go into a more detailed derivation of this using action principles. Okay, I think that the best way of understanding this is, is using action principles. Um, given that, I, I, you know, I, I don't know, I mean, like, how many of you know Lagrangian mechanics, the Lagrangian formulation of mechanics? Okay, so I don't feel like it would be appropriate for me to go through it at this point. Um, how about this? If you prove this exercise, prove this theorem. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. So a favorite game that you could play to yourself is name a conserved quantity and try and figure out the corresponding symmetry. Okay. Someone name a conserved quantity. Try and figure out the corresponding symmetry. It's a fun game. Okay. I mean fun. Certain definition of fun. Okay. Um, let me um, give you a bit of an example of this uh, transformation law between energy and momentum at work. So we saw that a photon has an energy which is proportional to its frequency and a momentum which is proportional to its frequency. <coughs> And you'll see that under the Lorentz transformation rule, the energy and momentum will change. And so that means that the frequency of the photon will change. But this is exactly something that we've seen before. Okay. In fact, this transformation law, when applied to photons, using this relationship between the energy and the momentum of a photon and its frequency, is nothing more or nothing less than the relativistic Doppler effect that we have already discovered. And this is a fact that I will not explain to you because you will show it on your next problem set. So then this transformation rule is the Doppler effect. Again, this is one of those examples in special relativity of the fact that all of these different effects in special relativity that we describe, they all play with each other nicely. And if you forget about one of them, uh, you'll get very confused. So for example, if you learned about the Doppler effect, but didn't know about the transformation rule for energy and momentum, you would arrive at a contradiction. It's only when you combine all of these effects together that you'll end up with a physically sensible picture 
of uh, what's going on. So I should make one uh, important comment, which is that the transformation rule for energy and momentum is linear in ENP. Meaning that if you look at, for example, this expression up here, the left and the right hand sides of this equation are both linear in E and P. So if you think about it for a minute, this means that they also hold for collections of objects. If you have a collection of objects, each of which has an energy and a momentum, then you could calculate the total energy of the system and the total momentum of the system. And then because each one of those individual energy and momenta will transform according to the rule that I described above, then we could just sum up all of those individual momenta and energy and see that the total energy and momentum of the system will also transform according to this Lorentz transformation rule. What does this mean? This means that if E and P are conserved in one frame, they are conserved in all frames. Namely, if the total energy and total momentum are constant, the same before and after some process, then they'll be constant in any frame. Thus, the values of E and P for a given object might change depending on the frame in which they are measured. The fact that energy and momentum are conserved is true in every frame. And in fact, this conservation rule is incredibly useful for understanding the dynamics of objects in special relativity. And I should just uh, mention as an aside that just as uh, in the case when we were studying the geometry of space-time, uh, if you want to consider the motion of objects in three spatial dimensions, rather than just one spatial dimension, then the energy and momentum vector will transform just like the time and spatial vectors. Um, so, uh, for example, If you assemble space and time into a four component column vector, and then you ask how they change under a rotation by some angle theta about the z axis, well, then they change by this four by four rotation matrix of the sort that we have already encountered in this class. So this is the formula for the relationship between the X and Y coordinates if you were to perform a rotation by an angle theta about the z-axis. So I'll just give a name to that matrix since I don't want to rewrite it many times. I'll just call it, call it R of theta comma z hat. And then if you ask how energy and momentum transform
under that same rotation, well, they'll just transform by the multiplication by that same matrix. And I've introduced those factors of C in order to uh, be able to treat energy and momentum on completely the same footing, just as I introduced the factor of C in the time coordinate, just so that I can treat X and CT on exactly the same footing. So this statement about rotations is one that you all uh, are presumably familiar with. So this statement is hopefully not terrifying to you. Is it, it is, I saw one nod. Does that mean it is terrifying to you or that it is not terrifying? Okay. Yes. The, the arrangement of the cosines and sines that matrix, is that just feel like the other rotation matrix? Um, oh my lord. No, this is supposed to be the one such that if you rotate by an angle zero, you don't do anything. And cosine of zero is one, sine of zero is zero. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean you worried about the sine? Oh, come on. You, you can't expect me to remember exactly where that sign goes. The way that you figure out where the sign goes is you draw the picture and then, yeah, maybe there's a minus sign. I remember, I think I had a minus sign. I didn't say whether I was right-handed or left-handed, right? There's a right-handed rule and a left-handed rule. Okay. Maybe I'm using the left-handed rule here. Would you like to put that sign there? Okay, fine. There you go. Are you happy? Good. It's all about making people happy, right? Okay. And likewise, for a boost, you would have some expression like this. This would describe a boost by a rapidity phi in the x direction. So I'll call, the, I'll give that matrix a name. I'll call it L, or maybe I'll call it B for boost of phi comma x hat. And then as we have seen, the relationship between the energy and momenta in between the primed and unprimed frames would be given by that same boost matrix. So just as we could write down general Lorentz transformations in three dimensions by assembling T, X, Y, and Z into a four component column vector and then acting on them with some four by, by multiplication with a four by four matrix. Uh, you can think about the transformation of energy and momentum in exactly the same way. And in fact, <clears throat> there are some words associated with this observation. So uh, this observation leads to a notion uh, which I won't emphasize too much in this class, but which I will bring up for, uh, uh, you know, for because it'll be referred to uh, later on in your physics education. And that's the concept of what is known as a four vector. So what is a four vector? A four vector is a set of four frame dependent quantities whose values in different frames or in different coordinate systems are related by the same transformation rules as delta x and delta t. So we have in this class 
encountered two four vectors, well, ct, x, y, and z, and e, px, py, and pz, and in your lives as physicists, you will encounter uh, at least a few other four vectors. Uh, can anyone give me an example of another four vector? Uh, good, actually, that's true. So, um, good, yeah. So, for example, the set of four differential operators, d by dt times 1 over c, d by dx, d by dy, and d by dz, also transforms as a four vector. You know this, I know you know this, because you did the last problem set, where you were understanding how the wave equation in one coordinate system was related to the wave equation in another coordinate system. So every time you have a four vector, you can form one invariant quantity out of it by taking the uh, relativistic Minkowski space version of the inner product. So in the case of the four vector with t, x, y, and z, that gave you the invariant interval. In the case of the four vector built out of e, p, x, p, y, and p, z, that gives you the rest mass. That's what we saw last time. And in the case of the four vector built out of these four derivatives, this gives you the second order differential operator that is the wave equation. Otherwise known as the Dillon version, if you've heard, if you've heard that vocabulary before. Uh, that actually wasn't the one I had in mind, though. Can anyone think of another one? In your electromagnetism classes, have you seen the vector potential? Oh, okay, no wonder you didn't guess it. Okay, never mind, then. Um, but there are lots of other four vectors. Good. Okay. So, so far, all of our discussions of energy and momentum have been a little bit abstract, so what I would like to do now is just give you a couple examples of these rules at work. And I'll give you two, I think, very interesting examples, maybe three, depending on how much time we have, um, that I think will make it clear just how strange uh, and interesting uh, special relativity is as compared to our Newtonian intuition. Um, so let's imagine that we're playing billiards. Or, no, you know, or pool. Okay, it can either be pool or billiards. Not snooker. I don't, I'm not actually sure what snooker is. Is it the same as billiards? Kind of? Okay. Um, so let's imagine that we have a billiard ball, which is colliding with another billiard ball, and they scatter off of one another. Okay. So that after this process where they hit each other, they both go flying off by some angle theta. And let's say that they scatter at the same angle. Okay, they don't need to, but let's say that they do. So how many of you, let's do a test of how many of you spend too much time playing pool. If they scatter at the same angle, does anyone know what angle they'll scatter on? Yeah, so they'll scatter, say it'll be 45 degrees, so the relative angle between them is 90 degrees. So let's see uh, if that's still true in special relativity. You know it's not going to be true, otherwise I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't be doing this problem. But let's see that. Okay. So, and to do that, let's use the conservation of energy and the conservation of momentum. So before the scattering process, Let's calculate the momentum of the system. So the momentum of the first billiard ball will, well, if I want to write down this, so I'll, let me write down the momentum for vector, namely the set of four quantities which are conserved, whose first component is the energy, whose second component is the momentum, and whose, so whose second component will be the momentum in the x direction, third momentum in the y direction, 
fourth momentum in the z direction. So this would be the momentum four vector of the first pool ball, cube billiard ball. And I'm writing it as a row vector instead of a column vector, because if I write too many column vectors, I'll have to scroll so far down that you won't be able to see anything. I suppose I included a definition of C in my definition of the four vector. I'm leaving that C off because I'm not actually going to do a Lorentz transformation. I'm just going to use conservation by setting the various components equal to one another. Likewise, the four momentum, that is to say the four component vector, whose components are energy and the three components of momentum, for the billiard ball that is at rest, well, that has energy mc squared and no momentum because it's at rest. And, of course, there is a relationship between E and P in my expression for the uh, four vector P1 before the process. They're related by the fact that the billiard ball has rest mass m so that P is the square root of E squared over C squared minus MC squared, M squared C squared. And that's just because E squared minus P squared C squared is equal to M squared C to the fourth. Okay. All I've done is rewrite that as a relationship between E and P. Okay, so that was beforehand. What about afterwards? Any questions? Afterwards, the energy and momentum of the first cue ball, well, let's call the energy E prime and the momentum P prime. So the momentum in the x direction is going to be P prime cosine theta. The momentum in the y direction is P prime sine theta. And of course, it'll have no momentum in the z direction because uh, we're good pool players and our pool balls stay on the xy plane. Okay. I, I don't always, that doesn't always happen when I play pool. Likewise, P2 will have components E prime, the energy, P prime cosine theta, and P prime times minus sine theta. Notice, of course, that the momentum in the y direction is going to be zero after the collision, just as it was before the collision. And so if we want to study the conservation of energy, then we should write down the total four vector describing the energy and momentum of the system, which is going to be, by the conservation of energy, equal to E plus mc squared P zero zero, for using the expression for the energy and momentum before the collision, and also equal to 2 E prime times uh, comma 2 P prime cosine theta 0, 0 after the collision. And the one more piece of information that we need to use is, again, our dispersion relation which relates E and P, but now after the collision, which tells us that P prime has to be equal to the square root of E prime squared over C squared minus M squared C squared, just, uh, just as it was before the collision. Okay, so let's, yes. Yes. <coughs> Sorry, by P1 and P2 here, um, let's just, okay. So we'll usually just denote by P a symbol that encapsulates that four component column vector. Um, you know, uh, I just needed to give a name. To, I didn't want to write down so many individual equations, so I'm assembling things into four vectors in order to make the notation a little easier. So by P1, I mean the four component column vector, uh, or I've written it as a row vector here to save space, whose components are energy and the three momenta. Okay. 
Sometimes we call that the form of Good, good question. Sorry about, <coughs> sorry about that. Yes. Is there a cosine missing? Is there a cosine missing? No. Good. Good. Right. So why is there no cosine missing? Let's study. Let's stare at that equation for a second, and let's use the d dispersion relation, which says that e squared minus p squared c squared is equal to m squared c to the fourth. Note that we have to take the square of the momentum vector. So what is the square of that momentum vector? Well, it's p prime squared times cosine squared theta plus p prime squared times sine squared theta. Cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. All is right in the world. And uh, we get that equation that I've written there. Good question, actually. Other questions? Okay, now, uh, in order to play relativistic billiards, we just need to go ahead and solve this equation in order to determine the angle theta. And let's solve it in terms of the energies. Okay, we could solve for it in terms of the momenta, but let's solve for it in terms of the energy. Okay. So the first equation is found by setting the first components of these four vectors equal to one another. So that E prime is E plus MC squared over two. So that P prime is the square root of one over C squared times E plus M C squared over two squared minus M, M squared C squared. And one can then set the second component of these vector equal to one another to determine cosine theta. So what is cosine theta? Cosine theta is one half P over P prime. In order to make the equations a little simpler, I'll calculate the square of cosine theta. So that means that'll mean that a lot of those square roots are going to disappear. So that's one half p squared over p prime squared. What was p squared? Well, we just rewrite the equation I wrote down above. P squared is e squared over c squared minus m squared c squared. Sorry, that's not a very straight line. P prime squared is 1 over C squared times E plus MC squared squared. And I've multiplied through by that factor of 4 in the denominator, so I'll get a minus 4 M squared C squared. And this is the expression for the angle of scattering between these two billiard balls as a function of E which was the energy of the incident billiard ball before the collision. So let's just go ahead and simplify that uh, for a minute because it's uh, an illuminating answer. So if you expand out this, let's multiply the numerator and the denominator by c squared. So the numerator is m e squared minus m squared c to the fourth. The denominator is e squared plus 2 e m c squared minus 3 m squared c to the fourth. So you can then actually notice that the bottom expression is just e minus m c squared times e plus m 3 m c squared. So you could divide the numerator and the denominator by e minus m c squared to get e plus mc squared over e plus 3 mc squared. <coughs> so this is the formula for the scattering angle between two billiard balls in special relativity. So, as always when you derive a formula like this in special relativity, the first thing that you should do is you should check and make sure that it reproduces your intuitive Newtonian physics result in the limit where all of the velocities are small compared to the speed of light. Okay. So in the non-relativistic limit, what does this look like? Well, the energy, I remind you, 
is the rest energy mc squared plus the uh, kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is tiny compared to mc squared in the non-relativistic limit. So that means that cosine squared theta in the non-relativistic limit is uh, one half or one quarter. So that cosine theta is one half. And what angle has cosine theta one half? Well, that's 45 degrees. That's billiards or snooker. I don't know what snooker is. I think it involves something where you push b balls around on a table. Um, yeah, it should be uh, one half of the square, I think. And then one over right. One half at the square theta equals Oh, I'm sorry. Cosine squared. Is, it, sorry, no, no, no. You're right, of course. Uh, when e is equal to mc squared, um, what do you get? You get two over four, so that's one half. And of course, cosine of 45 degrees is root one over root two, right? Okay. Sorry about that. It's what is the one that's cosine a half? It's like uh, 30 degrees. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you. Good. Okay. Let's consider now <coughs> a slightly different limit. Let's consider the relativistic limit, where the velocity of the incident billiard ball approaches the speed of light. What does that mean? That means that the energy is much, much greater than mc squared, because the kinetic energy overwhelms the rest energy. Now, of course, it's very difficult to achieve that with billiard balls, but with elementary particles, if one were scattering a proton off of another proton, uh, such as at the LHC, that is exactly uh, the regime that you would be in. Because the rest energy of a proton would be very, very small compared to its kinetic energy because it's moving so quickly. Because you've built a very, very expensive uh, accelerator. So, not that I have anything against the LHC. It's awesome. But, you know, it's not easy to do that. Um, so in this limit, what happens? Well, cosine squared theta approaches 1, so that theta approaches 90 degrees. So that in the relativistic limit, these guys will scatter off at a total end in exactly the opposite direction. Very different from the Newtonian answer. So you can now understand, at least intuitively, what would happen if we were playing a game of relativistic billiards. If you wanted these balls to scatter at a different angle between 45 degrees and 90 degrees, you just need to hit the ball with more and more force. And as you hit it with more and more force, it would become more and more relativistic, and the angle would increase from 45 degrees gradually up to 90 degrees as you imparted such a vast energy into the uh, initial billiard ball that it would, uh, its velocity would approach the speed of light. Questions? Yes? What's that? I, I didn't hear you. Uh, it actually, if you, if you, so you need to be a little more careful. Um, uh, but, well, first of all, cosine of, okay. Uh, actually, wait. Yeah, okay. Uh, we need to be a little careful here. Should theta be zero? Wait, um, yeah, wait, did I make a mistake here? Did I incorrectly take, is it, uh, no, I guess it's, um, it's 180 degrees, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So it's not actually zero, but it is 180 degrees. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I mis I incorrectly took the cos I, I incorrectly took uh, the in inverse cosine. It could be zero too, but it's not. Yeah, okay. That's because I took a square here to make life easier. If you didn't take the square and you were careful about keeping track of the signs, you would find that it's uh, not zero. 
Uh, it means that they scatter off like that, right? Yeah, it means, right? Yeah, wait, what does it mean? I mean, it, 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 I mean, it means that as you, um, yeah, no, that doesn't make sense. Maybe it is zero. Okay. Did I make a mistake here? what happens when you, okay. I was never very good at billiards. Um, okay, exercise for the reader. Okay. Find the correct version of this statement. It might be worked out in your textbook, I don't remember. Yeah. Sorry about that. Is it really a bit of zero? Okay, I don't actually remember. We could go through it and work it out if we want, but we're almost, I see, it, we're almost out of the time, so um, I won't try and do that in real time. Sorry about that. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Good, good, uh, good work uh, catching my mistake. Okay, um, so next class I'm going to just finish our discussion of um, relativistic dynamics. Um, I have a couple more uh, examples. I think I'm not going to have time to do them uh, this class, so we'll just leave them for next class. Okay, I will see you guys not Monday. Monday is a holiday, correct? Yes. Yes, so I'll see you Wednesday. <laughs>